guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. We've had a lot of fun projects this past week and beautiful weather. Like right now it's 62 outside and it's breezy, but that means it's bringing in a cold front. One of our days this weekend, the high is like 66, the low is 43. Mm -hmm. And then the days after that are fairly cool and then it just pops back up into the low 80s. I'm just loving this year. We've had so much rain feels weird bragging about the rain because of how many people haven't had it but you don't understand well a yeah. lot of you do you understand our plight here we're in high desert in eastern oregon and our annual rainfall is typically like 9 to 11 inches which is for some of you guys who get like what 30 to 40 or something mm -hmm. that's a huge difference so when we get a ton of rain like any rain at all we're just i wonder what we've had so far this year i don't know where can one find that information i tried googling yeah just to see if there was some like local like does the extension office or someone like that keep somebody track? watching has got to know yeah i texted your mom about it because she's usually up on stuff like yeah. that and she's like oh i need to break out my midwest roots and get myself <laughs> a rain gauge but typically we don't fuss with stuff like that because it doesn't matter it's so yeah. little but i mean it's like soaking rains like yeah. rains where we get to turn the drip system off for three days in a row after mm -hmm. we've had it and big lightning and thunderstorms and a lot of them have not been accompanied by tons of wind yeah like we'll get five minutes of wind right before the storm arrives and then the storm comes it's really fun to watch the kids love it and then it just gives us rain and moves on mm -hmm. it's just been it's been a gift this spring and i feel like too uh, we've had the best year outside in terms of staying on top of things getting mm -hmm. things in the ground paul and bethany are on it with the weeds and the drip and the mulch everything just looks so good it just feels like a great year so i love it <laughs> it's awesome and on that we will jump into the first video which was the brick patio update tour they had finished laying the bricks but they hadn't finished the sand the bonding sand mm -hmm. yet which they have finished that at this point point. and it's interesting because they went back to the sand they had used prior on the rest of our brick work around the house and it looks perfect um, but if you noticed in that video where they stopped the brick pathway last fall they had tried out a different new kind of sand and i'm not 100 percent certain why they did that mm -hmm. when they had been using i mean they were butting up to a walkway that had a different sand in it yeah that they had finished prior years um and so i'm not sure why there was the switch and it totally ruined our bricks like we're thinking of if we can't get a wash that takes them off we've tried different types of acid wash and um power washing and different cleaners and nothing has budged that white film mm -hmm. they just look white all the time like you can't you can see a very stark difference between last year's bricks and this year's bricks so benny has a rep coming from that sand company i don't Did know you remember the name of the company no hmm. i don't like I, I don't even know that Benny I told say me. I it was one of those, like one of the most common brands. No, I think that's the one that he went back to. Oh, and it's it's beautiful, it's perfect. And yeah. so anyway, it, it's a huge bummer. Hopefully, we get something that works. If not, we're going to be redoing the bricks right there. Yeah. I just, you know, I, I know that it would probably bother, maybe it wouldn't bother some of you guys, but it would bother, it would bother me and a lot of you to see one color of brick and then right in the middle of the walkway have another color of brick mm -hmm. start up. So, and on a brand new project like that, you kind of want it to all look. Uniform? Yeah. Yeah. And then we did go down, I think this was a Saturday morning that we started this. I think this video kind of spanned over the course of a couple of days, but we went down and picked up some boxwoods that had just arrived down at the garden center and I was excited to get those, they're big and beautiful. And then I did a bunch of random stuff, like random container planting, the urns behind the Hartley, the wicker pots up front, pots at the end of the west side, planted some sweet potato slips because you know they showed up in the mail. So yeah. we got those in and I think they all took. They've all produced new leaves and they're looking good. So uh, anyway, Tina said, will you mow the aisles in the new garden? Yes, in the cut flower garden, I'm guessing that's. Mow the cut flower garden. Th those are kind of grass aisles. Oh, you mean like the pathways, the grass? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Uh, Ginger said, how often does Aaron mow the lawn and how tall? Oh, geez. Um, okay, so I mow it at around three inches and once a week. At this point of the year, you would almost do twice a week. Yeah, you can get, yeah. It but gets a little wooly. And some of it goes to seed. <laughs> but like it's starting yeah. to go to well, seed in by the, the spring, time. In the spring, it yeah. does. But you know, in the spring, sometimes it goes to seed like three days after you've mowed. That's true. So you really, yeah, you could do it twice a week. But that's just, 
you know, it takes a couple hours to mow. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of time yeah. to devote to doing it twice a week. I just forgot to mention, Aaron is wearing headphones today. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's a little different than normal. But last week we had this buzz in the audio yeah. and that's the only way he can kind of monitor. We've done some testing to see where the buzz was coming from and we can't quite figure it out. But so far it sounds okay to you, right? Yeah. So I do apologize for the echoey video last week, but a lot, a lot of you didn't seem to be bothered by that. So thank you for that. Uh, Angela said, okay, I'm gonna have to put my foot down and say no to the roses on the arbor. And I don't, I know, we will not put roses on the arbor. I kind of knew it as I was saying it, like mm -hmm. that's probably a dumb idea. Cause as I was saying it, I was looking over at the Colette roses in the vegetable garden, which you can hardly get through those arbors right now cause they're still in bloom and they're glorious. Um, but one of the reasons why we wanted that wider open path, which Angela states here, is that you know, like we want a very clear corridor to get the groceries to the kitchen without like roses reaching you and yeah. grabbing your arms or bags. Or However, we generally park the truck uh, on the side entrance and take the groceries in that way. I mean, <clears throat> but she's she's right. Yeah. We should not do roses. Right. You know, but. Yeah, so my impressionist roses, which I was thinking would be real pretty there, are going somewhere else. No worries. Diana said, do you know if the wicker pots you planted with purple flowers are still available and or the brand on those? We had a company send those to us in early MPG days. MPG planters? Was it MPG? Yeah. I don't know if they still have them available. Mm -hmm. Mine are like starting to fall apart. I have to use wood. I use wood stain on them uh, maybe once a year, probably once a year is about routine. And it kind of spruces them up a little bit, but some of them are like crumbly. They're resin, mm -hmm. but they're starting to crumble because I've used them so much. You were even like, why are you even planting those? Aren't you going to move them? They don't fit it, to me. They don't fit in that spot. No, they really they, don't. They look out of place. But there's nothing else there, so I thought they're hooked up onto drip. Yeah. They've got soil in them. We're just going to plant these. So going back to the arbor, I thought oh. at one time that you were going to put uh, pillars. Are you not going to do that anymore? Arbors tend to like beckon you forward. Uh -huh. And I feel like having an arbor there, because we are having a gate built right now, so there was a little arched, like a, almost like a gothic arch gate that led to the fireplace area. And there's a guy in town who does iron work. We took the gate down there and he's fabricating another one so that we can have kind of a side entrance to that boxwood area. Um, but it'll be, or to that patio, patio. either. Yeah. And that will be to the left, like maybe 10 feet to the left mm -hmm. of the arbor. If I have the gate and then two more short things, it's going to be like, which... But they'll be in separate beds. I think you, yeah. you'll have the boxwood And there'll be divine. flagstones, flagstones to the gate uh -huh. right there. I hope the, none of this is probably making sense to you guys, but um, I don't know. There's, a, there's some kind of magic about arbors and gardens uh -huh. to me. I mean, we don't have to put one there because I don't plan on planting anything on it right away. Yeah. But we could pop a couple arbors there and, or pillars there and see what we think. We do need light. Yes. Over there. Definitely, definitely need light. That's so whatever for sure. you decide, there needs to be either a lamppost or, you know, if we if you did a pillar, you could do a light on top of the pillar or, or something like that. But, right. but definitely light. Yeah. Uh, Wendy said, you gave a quick update tour on your pumpkins. Do you thin those seedlings out or just leave them to grow together? I just kind of leave them to grow together. I mean, in that case out there, a lot of the pumpkin seeds I was using, I've had for several, several years. So instead of popping like three seeds in a hill, I would do like five or six seeds in a hill. And if they happen to all germinate, I just let them do their thing. They have space to just go for it out there anyway. Um, Carol said, how do you secure the arbor in the ground? I have strong wind like you do. Um, most arbors, well, I would hope most arbors come with some kind of a um, staking system. So uh, like that arbor and the arbor that we took to Monica's house, they have these spikes, these metal spikes that you can pound down in the ground that have an open tube on the top. So once you get the spikes in the ground, so they're you know down in the ground this far, then you put your arbor over it and slide your arbor, your arbor legs down in the holes of those Mm -hmm. spike things and it keeps them fairly secure you can also use pieces of rebar we do that a lot too. drive the rebar into the ground just right up next to one of the legs and then you can lash it together with zip ties or something most of the time you don't see it because you've got some kind of a vine growing on it or you can do it so low that you don't really notice it mm -hmm. brian and tammy said i've been meaning to ask for a long time if you rotate your vegetable crops i don't think in all the years i've been watching that you ever get real pest problems on your vegetables why is that what is your secret um I do, I'm mindful about alliums and that's pretty much, and tomatoes, I think. 
but that's pretty much it. I make sure that if I planted garlic in one bed the prior year, I try not to plant garlic in the same bed so that I don't have the same crop taxing the soil in the same way. Um, same with tomatoes, try to rotate those around, but I don't really think about it that much just because we amend so heavily. We use a lot of land and sea compost. We lose a lot of biotone starter fertilizer. So soil wise, I feel like we add all the nutrients back in. So I don't think it would really matter. Pest wise, oh boy, we just, we've been pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. um, I do have stuff eating my cabbage leaves and broccoli and we've sprayed BT one time on those. And we typically leave stuff alone until I notice it like actually, like either looking really bad or if it starts to um, make the plant less productive, then we'll spray something on it. And it's usually like a Captain Jack's or something like that. Uh, but it's rare. We don't spray vegetable crops all that much for anything. Mm -hmm. I do know with the vine crops last year, we I noticed squash bugs. And then for after I noticed that first set of squash bugs, I just saw two. And that's all I found. I scoured. I only had six hills last year, so it was easy to do. I couldn't do it probably with the amount I've got this year or if I had more than that, but I inspected every single leaf, the ground all around them, and I only found those two adults. I killed them. I did find one little thing of eggs, and I squished all of those, and then I checked those plants in the same way for about 10 days afterward. I found more adults, found more eggs, killed them all, and then Paul was coming along after we found that first set of squash bugs, and he sprayed spinosad, so the Captain Jack's dead bug, once a week, and he also put diatomaceous earth down, which for us, in normal years, we're fairly dry, and the, the uh, diatomaceous earth hangs out for a while, and so I think he was applying that maybe twice a week, and after about two or three weeks, Nothing, no more squash bugs the entire season, which was awesome. Now, I did learn the prior year, I had planted up like 30 vine crops and then I had this blue Hubbard squash plant <laughs> left over and I ended up planting that at the end of our fall gold raspberry beds because I didn't have enough raspberries to fill it and all the squash bugs went to that blue Hubbard. And I did learn that it is a host plant for squash bugs. So if you want to like uh, strategically plant blue Hubbard squash around your vine crops, more than likely they'll attack that one more than your others if you're wanting to stay away from uh, sprays and stuff altogether. Tina said, I've noticed sometimes you tie in the end of the drip line to form a loop and sometimes you just end it with a plug. Can you tell us what the difference is? I think we used to be a little bit more um, focused on making sure it was like a grid mm -hmm. and it all kind of went back you know it was all like it didn't end somewhere sure i think it depends on the run mm -hmm. like how far you're running the the drip like on the west side when we did the the drip line for all the boxwoods and things like that we did split it up into two zones mm -hmm. and we did a grid so that we make sure to have enough pressure to do the whole thing yeah i think you just need to be mindful that you don't just run a snake and there's a, you know, a beginning and an end, mm -hmm. just at some point in there, you know, tie some parts in. Mm -hmm. So you might have like one leg of it that dead ends and another leg that dead ends, but like the majority of it is all kind of connected into a loop. Mm -hmm. So I think that's kind of the whole idea is just don't go too far yeah. uh, with a dead end. Right. Uh, Gail said, your thoughts about replacing a winter gem boxwood hedge that's over 25 years old and looks horrible this year? Do I, play, do I replace it with more winter gems or use some other kind of boxwood? It kind of depends on what the problem is with your winter gems. You know, I know with ours, we're having a little bit of a, uh, an issue with our sprinter boxwoods at this point. They're up big enough that uh, when we get that big deluge of rain, they kind of splay over a little bit. Um, and a they, lot. yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. <laughs> they splay over a little bit. We showed you in video so you know exactly what it looks like. I actually went out with a broom after rain to broom extra weight off of the, like to knock extra moisture off the boxwoods. I don't want to have to do that after a yeah. rain. Like after heavy snow, I can understand that, but not having to monitor it. So we have, you know, on one side of our driveway, there's a little swoop of winter gems and then there's a long run of sprinters and the winter gems were all fine. Um, looked great after mm -hmm. the rainstorm and the sprinters are all in that, you know? Um, so yeah, we are considering replacing our sprinters with winter gems because they do really well for our area. And I think there's different types that just do better in different spaces. If you have, I don't know what the life expectancy is on a boxwood. I would think 25 years is maybe getting close to the end though. Yeah. So like if you replaced them with winter gems, if you're not dealing with any kind of issue, like 
virus or insect mm -hmm. or anything like that, I would think you would be okay replacing it with the same thing. Yeah. But if you're struggling like with the shape, like we are with the sprinters, or if you're struggling with any other issue, you might try something different. I do know like the green mountain boxwoods and the green velvets, both of those stay a darker green for us mm -hmm. during the winter time. And I like that a lot. The bronze. They just aren't as vibrant during the summer. Right. So but it's like a yeah. more like a it's a it's a deep green, but it's not. Um, it's not like glossy. It's not and, glossy. Yeah. Right. It's kind of like muted, Matt. matted. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's pros and cons to every one of them. Uh, Lindsay said, "If Proven Winner said you could name a super tunia, what would it be called, and what color would it be?" Oh, geez, I have never thought about that. It would be called Laura, and it would be called it would be salmon. Sam like a really soft salmon. It'd be like um, Bermuda Beach, but the color that you want, not the color that it actually is. It'd be like the it'd the be old more Bermuda toward, Bermuda yeah, Beach. Yeah, towards salmon. Yeah. And it would have the vigor of bubblegum. Yes. Not a purple one. And you think salmon right away over purple. That's interesting to me. Yeah. And <laughs> it would be resistant to budworms. Yes. I don't think I would name it after myself, though. I think I would name it after one of our kids. That would be kind of a big deal if they could make uh, budworm resistant yes. supertunias. Oh, that would be huge for us. We'll uh, we'll send an email. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have so much I'm influence. I'm sure they know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next video: planting shade master locust trees. I love those trees so much. It made I was like, Aaron, I think they've got some more down there. We should go get more. Um, plus containers, plus mowing the lawn. Another menagerie video, basically. Uh, Amber said, how many seasons slash years do you water new trees? I just lost a maple this year. It was about the size of the locust Laura planted, and I have no idea what went wrong. We have a lot of clay, and I'm wondering if I overwatered it. It's it's possible. Um, we, we... Always water. Always, well, yeah. You, we have stuff planted underneath all of our trees. Mm -hmm. So we don't water them specifically. Right. But they get whatever the plants... Are getting. I try to be mindful though when we're planting under trees. Like we just planted a bunch of stuff under the ash tree. It's gorgeous. I cannot wait to show you guys. Um, but when Paul came along after I planted and he was running the drip, and we decided instead of running brown drip tube under there, um, we just did black solid poly and ran individual emitters to the plants so we didn't have a bunch of saturation that was kind of unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, that ash tree, it, I don't know. It's interesting, and I know I'm kind of veering from the question, but um, it was under, or there was lawn under it for I don't know how many years of its yeah, life. So it's it was getting, getting a lot of water. It was getting a lot of water, and then we took that out, and then I wondered for a while, like, should we be supplementing? It's so used to getting all of this water, and then all of a sudden it doesn't get it anymore um, from like three sides of it. Mm -hmm. You know, we removed that, so maybe it'll be happy to have just that little bit of water from the plants we put under it. But like for new trees, um, we do make sure that they're well watered like mm -hmm. we'll go every other day and fill those wells up and let it really soak down but we've had so much rain too yeah and there are such small canopies that the <clears throat> rain's actually getting to the root ball but the second year we kind of relax on it they still have drip to them but we're not giving them any supplemental water the second year typically melissa said what is that hopper on the back of the lawnmower would you share information about it yeah i love it it is the 20 bushel, I think John Deere calls it the material collection system, I think. And um, I had the guys at our John Deere dealer wire up, because uh, it normally comes with like a button on the side, but I had them wire it to the console. And so you just press a button and it just dumps the grass. You have to have a place where you can, you know, an open area like we have where you can dump the grass. Um, but I, I hated, I hated, you know, dumping the grass wherever we were putting it mm -hmm. you know i hated getting off the lawnmower and because those get really heavy especially if you're mowing wet grass oh man yeah. those are really heavy to get off and, and they're messy they're like real dirty yeah right yeah. like you'll get your shoes you know like green. if you're wearing sneakers you know uh, that you don't want green mm -hmm. they'll get green um, but yeah i, I love it mm -hmm. 20 bushel i think the last one that we had that wasn't automatic was like a 14 bushel mm -hmm. so it you can collect even more grass. And I've seen people that are like, you know, you should just mulch the lawn. But again, like the lawn is so much less usable right after you mow. And then also like you have to, if you're gonna mulch, you have to mow a lot more often. Right. Whereas if you're bagging, I can get away with doing it once a week, but I could not get away, I don't think, with mulching once a week. I would mm. have to do it twice a week. Sure. Because when you get the grass, when the grass gets too tall, the lawnmower just can't, it can't mulch it up. 
So I don't know if this is included, but what are your thoughts on a zero turn versus what you have? Because I've noticed that question quite often. Like, why wouldn't you do a zero yeah. turn to be faster? I don't think a zero turn is that much faster. And it's certainly not as like pleasant. leisurely. It's not, it's not as pleasant. You have to use both hands, right? Yeah. So you're engaged the whole time. It's more work. And I have one of those balls on the steering wheel to where you could just use one hand to kind of mm -hmm. like turn the steering wheel like this. Um, so I test drove a uh, zero turn and it just, it felt like more work. I, it probably is faster if I was doing this like for work and I needed to get done really quickly. Like if I had a lawn mowing business, I probably would go with a zero turn. Could you put one of those self dumping baggers though on a zero well, turn? Well, that's the other thing. Yeah. Is that a, a lawn tractor has so many more uses than a zero turn because you can, you know, you've got like a PTO so you can hook up a, um, a tiller on mm -hmm. the back of it. You know, you can put a snow plow on the front and you can like put a more, more power. Yeah. You, well, no, less no. power. Actually. Oh, less power. Yeah, really? I think, it, I think so. Cause I know with a zero turn, you can drive faster and it supposedly but you can, can push mow. snow with a lawn tractor. Could you do that with a zero turn? If, if one know. could put I a plow on the front of it? <laughs> no, I don't know all the ins and outs, but I, I want to say that a zero turn has more power mm. just because I know that they can mow faster, like faster speed. Sure. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't really know, but I do think that the lawn tractor is just like a pleasurable. Yeah. And you've got cup ride. holder for your yeah, beverage right. and yeah, it's more of a, an event. Yeah. It's like a, ch a rather chill than a, experience rather than a huge chore. Right. Michelle said the passion you have for that grass. My husband is exactly the same as you with his John Deere lawnmower and all. We took so much advice from you and our neighbors cannot stop complimenting our grass. Do you have something on your lawnmower to have such defined lines? No, uh, you can put um, like a sweeper on it. What do they call those? Stripe. A striping kit. Mm -hmm. I don't have one. It just, the stripes are what Boy, from the lawnmower. The way you did it in that video. Yeah, it looked good, huh? It looked good. Yeah, yeah it looked really good. Uh, Claire said, you put those couplers in so easy. My fingertips may never feel like again after putting in all my emitters. What's your trick? You know, when it's hot out, it's a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Half inch couplers are so much easier than quarter inch because quarter inch are so like fiddly. Mm -hmm. um, like they need to make the wings like longer on those, like in the yeah. middle of, you know, where you're putting them. Uh, my, the ends of my fingers do start to hurt a little bit if I'm doing a lot Some of couplers. Some brands are easier than others yeah. too. And you kind of have to play with it. Right. Like you might find that Rainbird is a little bit easier than Dig Corp or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever brand you're buying. I, I don't know. I think too, like I do it for a job, you know, I do uh, couplers and emitters and all kinds of stuff all the time. So I might be a little bit more and my hands are just don't look close at my hands. They're, they're working hands and they're, they're used to it. And so I think there's that element too. Lynette said, does the garden center put that together for the customer or did they order in it in from the grower that way? The planters. The ones my mom planted up in the garbage cans. Yeah. So there's a home up in McCall, Idaho, that's on a lake and it's like kind of a Swiss looking house. I don't know if that's the way you describe that style, but they have huge window boxes that are like red lacquer. And so um, you slide these like garbage can looking planters down in these window boxes. The bottom is metal so that none of the water will ever touch the sides of these window boxes, but they have to be huge yeah. to accommodate one, the garbage can and then three of them you know, three wide. And my mom had uh, rock and blue suede shoes, I think, mm -hmm. uh, salvia, a green potato vine, some white, supertunia mini vista yellow, and then maybe supertunia mini vista white. Mm -hmm. So there's a blue, white, and yellow and chartreuse mix with that red window box. I don't know how they transported those. I mean, they all made it up it there. It has to be a big trailer, big covered trailer. And they're going to have to cover them this weekend. Yeah, <laughs> because right. Because we were set to, I think we're still going to go up to... McCall this weekend with the kids and stay a night or two. Uh, we were planning on camping. Your family's camping. We're camping in a hotel for the evening, <laughs> but it was supposed to uh, snow possibly even. Yeah. The weather is really chilly up there this week. Clint says, what drone battery does Aaron use to keep his drone up for so long at the end? You had it like just sitting there, like you were driving it. Two batteries. Two batteries. So uh, the drone will last for like 30, 40 minutes or so, but um, the scene where it changed and it showed me dumping the grass, that was my opportunity to change the battery because it wasn't a static shot the sure. whole time. And then I just put the drone in kind of what I thought was the same spot. Mm -hmm. So it took two batteries. I remember Aaron saying that he was going to run the drone and I had set up the video at the end to say like, okay, we're going to end this with, you know, 
video of Aaron mowing the lawn, but I could not for the life of me figure out where the drone was. I'm like, I hope he has a camera out somewhere yeah. because I just said that we were going to show it. And finally I found it. it was like hovering over the South Garden for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. And I just didn't think I was looking everywhere else and I couldn't hear it. You know, earlier in the season, I put up a camera up on the house. I climbed up on the house, put a camera and I, what I thought was a good vantage point for the grass and I mowed the lawn and then I watched the video later and like you couldn't tell that I had done anything. <laughs> it was like the light was weird or not at the right angle yeah, to show. Yeah, it was like just a bad angle yeah. somehow. And it was just kind of like I go out there with the mower, but you can't. It was like not satisfying no. at all. <laughs> all that effort yeah. climbing up there. Michelle said, when I plant up my containers, I feel like the plants don't intermingle as I hope. Since you've probably planted a few more containers than I, do you have any tips on how to get more of a mixed cohesive look from all sides rather than differentiation between each plant? Uh, I think... For Less the, plants. Well, I think possibly less plants, but also a repeat of the same variety of plant on either side of the container. Um, so it, you're just going to have more of a block look. If you do four plants and you you know duh, 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 and they're all four different, they're going to kind of take up their own space and maybe intermingle a little bit. But if you have um, you know you do three uh, different things and then repeat one of those on the other side so that they can kind of it looks like they're kind of reaching out the other way. The biggest thing is probably just finding plants that don't. Uh, bully each other bully out. Bully each other out. Yeah. Because, like, you know, if you put a super tunia and then a couple other things that are, say, smaller, mm -hmm. like, you know. Yeah. I do, I do. I still try every year. I'm like, well, I'll just push the envelope here a little bit and then I regret it. That's why sometimes mono containers, just one plant, you know, planting like three of the same plant in a container, to me is striking because it, there's no, at least it's not fighting mm -hmm. with something, you yeah. know? It's like, if you can see a little bit of a plant, but not a lot, but it's like mm -hmm. just enough to ruin the symmetry mm -hmm. of the, the container. Yeah. You know what we did down at the garden center and I still design some of my pots this way, but we always used to do a centerpiece and then, and it depends on what size of container, but I'm talking like, what is this? 20 inches, Yeah. 20 inch diameter. You do your centerpiece and then you pick one thing to do three of, and you do like three super tunias in a triangle and then you do like your your foliage element so your sweet potato vine or helichrysum or whatever you're using and then you pick two other different things so like a super bells and a super beta mm -hmm. out that side so you get a little bit of a different texture but you've got that unifying three and that was always a fairly pleasant mm. thing to look at sandra said off topic but i know you've talked about a play area for the kids are you still going to be doing that it depends on how you define play area. They've got acres of play area. Yeah, right. You know, they're all over the place. And they've got bikes, um, like different trikes and things that they've been given as gifts. And they're at different areas. So there's a set of them by the uh, paved lane. There's a set by the west side. There's usually one on the brick patio. And there's some inside because they go round and around in our house, too. You know, we'll take them down to uh, the church, put up a new play set. But, you know, the last time we did that, they were like... They didn't Not care. impressed. Yeah. And I, I'm worried that if we went to the trouble of actually installing one, I mean, I had a set as a kid. We hardly ever used Same. it. Same. Yeah. It's like you use it a couple times and then it just sits there and looks bad. Yeah. And I think that's what would happen. The novelty is fun in the very beginning, but yeah, it just wears off. And I don't it. like the look of them I, no. in terms of like, I don't think it would look good anywhere that we put it. Well, you want it close enough proximity to your house where you can keep an eye on, mm -hmm. on them while they're playing and... Um, yeah, it would be hard to locate one. And I know some people will be like, well, that's not an excuse. You need to have a play area for your kids. But, you know, Benjamin spends a bunch of time in the barn. Mm -hmm. He loves to play with scrap lumber. And he's got, I think he's got a pile of nails and hammer out and some lumber out right now. Um, right, and right beside me here, we have a garbage sack laid out on the floor with a bunch of wood and some, we painted the other night, Benjamin and I. Um, there's all kinds of things that they do yeah. around here. So we're not too stressed about it. Joe said, change the subject. Is there anything you can do to that larger white arbor, sandblast and repaint, so Aaron would like it? No, it would be nothing could the be perfect done. size as the entrance onto the big brick. You know, it would be too big. If it's way too big. If you painted it black, if it was either stark black or stark white, it's the rust that I don't like. Sure. I don't like that dingy, yeah, I get that. rusty look. It just looks dilapidated. Sure. It would be too large though, because with like, if you had one gate open, that would fit the size of our, our opening, mm -hmm. but you'd need a grand, like something big and, and grand because open, that thing is probably eight feet wide, the opening, 
Six yeah. to six well, to not huge, like six, six to eight. Maybe. Still too big for the entryway right there. Plus, it would run into the golden rain tree and it would be fighting right mm -hmm. there. But um, yeah, if we painted it black, that might be the only case where it ends up back in our garden. Next video was trying new self watering containers that will be out in 2024. So, Jack Barnwell super awesome talented landscape designer that we've been able to get to know over the past several years um, he has been working with proven winners on aquapot design and they have the ceramic ones that are already out they're heavy mm -hmm. good quality like we've had them here before and they really do fit a niche because up to that point the only ones that we were familiar with were plastic and which is nice because they're lightweight and all of that, but there was nothing that was very pretty mm -hmm. that was out. So the initial aquapots are a lot prettier, much more elevated design. And so now they've come out with though the aquapot light, which are not plastic, they're a resin. And um, they just give, it gives you the ability to move them around easier. They're also less expensive to ship. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can imagine. Uh, so anyway, we're trying them out. That's, that's all. We got a few of them in the mail and we thought, well, I've got some plants out in the high tunnel, let's get them set up and we'll try them out and share with you guys. And I think they're also gonna be offering the insert, the aquapot yeah. insert just alone. So you can put it in your own container if you want to make it more of a self-watering situation. The reservoir holds right at three gallons of water. So I'm not sure how that compares to like the ones we've experienced, the True Drop. The True Drops uh, held more water. Um, so you possibly could go longer. Well, you could yeah. go longer between watering that way. But even if you can save yourself several days. Yeah, even if you're doing it every three days versus every single day. Right. You know, that's, it saves you that's time. still a lot better. I mean, you can leave for a weekend. Yeah. You know, and your flowers are going to look great when you get home. Uh, Penelope said, I see petunias in all the garden centers here in Central Oregon, but I can't seem to find super petunias. Are these only supplied by proven winners? Am I missing something? Um... Supertunias are only supplied by proven winners. So the growers that your garden centers are getting things from have to grow super tunia, uh, proven mm -hmm. winner supertunias in order to see them at your garden center. I don't know how to explain that better. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, there are some areas where I know that they're harder to find. Uh, our valley seems to be proven winners rich. Like everybody has proven winners stuff here. So it's never hard to find anything. Um, we even and, have like proven winners pop-up shops. Yeah. Like they'll, they'll grow proven winners. They'll be open for three weeks. Yeah. And then, or even less. Yeah. Like this last time they sold out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they just pop up, mm -hmm. sell supertunias and super bells and and then close up shop for the rest yep. of the season. Um, but I do know there was a little bit of grower defection in the Proven Winners line when Proven Winners started to require that their stuff was grown in their pots, which I think is a reasonable, reasonable thing for them to want. Um, so I know I feel some- like a lot of that has died down though. Yeah, it so has. I'm sure there's still some yeah. people that are still mad about it and not mm -hmm. <laughs> growing any. Yeah, because they cost more to, to grow them in the pots. But anyway, uh, Mimi said, have you considered also posting on Rumble? Yeah, we, I posted some videos on Rumble because somebody else mentioned it and nobody, I mean, we didn't like promote it, but we've never promoted our other platforms on different, I don't like doing that really. No, we've tried, we've dabbled in all kinds of different platforms, like yeah. trying different things out. Right. So I, at the same time, I was posting videos on Twitter and I was posting videos on Rumble and I was kind of like, let's just try a couple other platforms. And mm -hmm. Twitter was doing okay. We were getting like a couple thousand views maybe, you know, per video. And then Rumble, <laughs> Rumble was getting like between zero and four views maybe Ooh. per video i have kind of stopped uh posting there i mean i don't really i don't use rumble um i don't even know what it is uh, yeah, yeah i, I don't really either it, i've so. seen I, I have seen on twitter i've seen some people posting about some of the um maybe rumble is better for like live streaming i'm not really sure but i've i've seen some stuff on twitter saying that some people are getting like really high view counts on live videos oh which we don't do. Nope. Um, so I don't know. We're like in our little comfort zone here on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. And then we post like little bits here and there on TikTok. Yeah. You know, I don't know. We're just not like. We'll get not, a wild hair and do yeah, it for a little while. We're not and then... great at that, at like vertical content. The We've thing kinda... is though, you can only focus on so much. Yeah. You right. know, and you, uh, yeah, it just gets too convoluted and too much, too many yeah. details. And, and I would go crazy. Diane said, does it hurt your plants to have water in the reservoir all the time, or do you let them dry out a bit sometimes? And would the same apply to self-watering house plant pots? No one seems to address if you should keep them full all the time. We keep ours full all the time. If it's self-watering. No, we, I mean, it goes down. It goes down, but we just fill I it right think, back up. I think that soil naturally has a way of, um, 
like regulating itself when it has a water source below like things can can rot but it, it does have like a it's an oxygen exchange yeah so it like knows when it needs water um, and so it pulls it up. We've had really good luck with self-watering containers. Yeah. I don't really know exactly like how the science of it works, but I know that if you if you water from the top too often, you can rot your plants, but generally not with self-watering containers. Right. Same with house plant, self-watering as well. Amy said, these are so much more attractive than the original ones. Looking forward to seeing how they perform. I don't understand why some of these companies don't ask you and other gardeners for suggestions when designing products. We talk about that often. Yeah, we do. <laughs> like nobody, nobody asks our opinion. I would right. do this and this and this differently because, well, it's kind of like with the auger. We got our own kind of yeah. version of the auger made because it is so much better <laughs> to me uh, because after you use a certain product for so long, you kind of realize like, this is really heavy. I really wish it didn't have this. It's unnecessary to have the flighting so long, you know? It's, it's tough because a lot of times the things that you like and want are, are specific. Well, they're specific. They're, um, it's like, for example, the one that you like is hard to ship. Because it's a really tall, sure. you know, auger. It's much easier to ship a smaller auger. Um, so, like, it's like a, they would want to per, to push that. You know, power planter would want to push sure. a smaller auger. I'm sure. Um, I haven't so, used a small auger in years. Yeah, right. I think that you asked that question because I was talking about the um, water indicator. There has got to be a way this day and age. Oh, Jack told me uh, they have. <laughs> he's got a little like butterfly water indicator that you pop in that hole. Oh, really? And it like pops up. Is when that going to be included in it? Uh, he said he would send us a couple. Oh, I don't yes. know if it'll be included in the final product. It should. It yeah. should. Every self-watering container should have a water indicator somehow. I don't want to have to fill it up to where I see water rolling out the bottom or like the original aquats have that hole mm -hmm. that's right at the top of the reservoir. Well, you get your water up that high and it starts to, to flow out. There's a bunch of water that comes out. Even if you shut your water off yeah. immediately, I remember, remember we put it up on the wood patio, the wood uh, porch, and I watched that thing. I was watching it so close to see when the water level was up that high and it just we ended up having to move it because it would just leak water everywhere. Yeah. It was going to ruin my surface. Also in that video, we deleted a section um, because one of the, the pot in the middle, after you place them, it, um, it didn't drain properly. The and reservoir like fell too far down. Um, well, so I, I talked to the reason we deleted it and didn't show it is because I felt like it was a little unfair to them just because we didn't have time to include uh, the response from, from yeah, Jack. And these are just a testing year. They just wanted us to test them to see how they work for us. Yeah, see like if there's the any glitches. They're sending yeah. them to us early is to like, let them know if we see issues. Cause they don't want to send them to customers with issues. And Jack said that they're going to be able to fix it easily. He thinks what happened is that when they drilled the hole in the pot up, um, like a little bit of that resin, uh, like folded upward yeah. and then created a seal against the bottom of the reservoir. You, reservoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, he's like, that's an easy fix. We can, we can fix that. We can either drill down or we can do multiple holes or yeah. like, that's an easy thing. But so I think he was appreciative that we let him know that, yeah. but if we could have included that in the video that like we let them know, mm -hmm. cause it is a little unfair. Cause it's like, they're sending us a version of the product. That's so not done yet. That's not done. You <laughs> right. Know, so. Uh, Sandy said in any self watering container, are there any issues with mosquitoes breeding in the reservoir? Never I had that. I think they could get in there and. I mean, they could if I they suppose. really wanted to, but that would be, I think that's would Never be a very that rare. Yeah. Linda said, I have noticed that you do not seem to have any hanging baskets anywhere. Would that be because your space is not conducive to them or are they too labor intensive to have? We don't really have anywhere that's great to hang them. One. Two, I've never been a huge fan of hanging baskets. Yeah. And maybe that's because I haven't had like the appropriate place to hang them. I n really never have. Well, you know, so if you hang them on like, we do have a, our porch. But then they block your view. I like a clean They're, they're view. hard to water. Yeah. And they do block your view. Yeah. Just never been a, and I don't, like we've talked about adding things out in the landscape, like posts and things that we could hang them from. It's a lot of work. And I don't think I would like that. Yeah. It just, no, just don't really dig I it. I do like the hay racks though. I do too. But those don't, those are like tucked. Yeah. <laughs> they're kind of like tucked up and they're going to look pretty right there. Um, yeah. Shelly said, these look great. I'm wondering with the insert, does it need to fit the bottom of the pot perfectly or can there be room or a gap around the edge? 
Um, I think there can be a gap around the edge mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, if you're putting the reservoir, like we experienced with that one pot, if you're putting it down and it hits, you know, the, your pot's big enough at the bottom to where the reservoir sits right on top of the drain hole, I'd probably bump There's it. feet. There's is, feet is there on feet the on it? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't notice the feet, so you should be good then. But, you know, if you have a pot that also has the same, like it's not a flush uh, drain hole at the bottom uh -huh. and it's like, you know, it raises up or, mm -hmm. or whatever or the pot is not level and it, mm -hmm. you know, there's like a concave to it. That's then... happened. There are pots like that out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So you would need to make sure that it's compatible. Yeah. You'll know right away if it's draining or not. Right. Jan said in the last shot, you have metal raised beds in the back. Do you re recommend those for planting small trees in? I'm having a small space in the, in the backyard. So I was hoping to plant a tree or two in raised pots. Is this recommended? Um, yeah, I mean the huge soil reservoir in those, you could absolutely plant a tree. You would want to make sure in a zone six that you're picking out trees that are rated down to zone four and give you a buffer for wintertime temperatures. Other than that, I think you'd be good to go. Uh, Dan said, love the experiment area, the strawberry planter from the greenhouse. Do they stay up on their own with the wind or have have you staked them or are they grounded with spikes? Uh, this one is just sitting out there. And it was kind of a test too, mm -hmm. um, to put it out in the elements, like it gets no mercy wind out there. We've had some pretty stiff breezes here and there. Uh, I think that one night we had 60 mile an hour wind gusts. Mm -hmm. it, stayed, it stayed up. Yeah. So it's not staked in, there, there's nothing keeping it in. There must just not be enough there's a lot for of the weight. wind to grab. Yeah, it's, right. just, it's heavy enough. It is heavy enough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, next video was planting containers at an assisted living facility and children's nursery. Plus, I planted some cantaloupe seeds. So we were delivering some flower arrangements down to Wellsprings, which is an assisted living facility the week prior. And we noticed that long flower bed. Well, I keep calling it a flower bed. It's like a pot. Mm -hmm. Here, what would you call no, that? It's like a flower bed, like a raised flower bed. Raised flower, I guess so. Just a very narrow one. We were noticing it had a drip line in it, but there were no flowers. And here we are in June. And I thought, well, I bet you, I don't know if they're going to get it planted this year. So we asked if um, they would like us to come back and plant it up. And they were like, sure. So anyway, that was a really fun project. And then we took some plants down to the Children's Relief Nursery, which we plant those containers up every year for the past several years. So we got that done. And then I planted some Tuscany melon seeds once we were home. And those are all up now. Amy said, love how excited you got seeing your first broccoli. It's my first time growing garlic this year and you said yours is starting to dry down. What does that mean? So that broccoli, you guys, I cooked that up for dinner and Samantha almost single-handedly ate the entire thing. I had a small little portion on my plate and you and Benjamin did, you yeah. both passed on it. I put some on, I made him eat one bite of it, um, but I put like three little bites on his plate, but she was just like more, more. And yeah. she ate that whole thing down. I was so proud of her. Um, the growing garlic, when it's starting to dry down, you'll notice that the bottom leaves start to yellow and kind of turn crispy. And you only want to wait until like two, three, maybe four of those leaves have dried down uh, before you harvest because the amount of dryness you have at the bottom indicates the covering around your head of garlic down there. And if you let it dry down too much, that covering, the protective covering for storage will not be as nice it'll probably be broken down a lot more we typically harvest right around the fourth of july so we're getting really close we'll notice the tips starting to to uh, curl and dry as well so i really should take a look i might need to harvest mine a little bit early nikki said would you please do a video on some of your favorite garden cocktails and dinner recipes utilizing your produce i was thinking about that the other day i used to do a lot more of that mm -hmm. and it just I just haven't. And I wonder if I just naturally do more of that when it gets a little hotter and we have mm -hmm. less planting to do and things. But yeah, I have been thinking about it and need to know what to do with cabbage. Same. <laughs> I use cabbage for like the same couple of recipes and then I haven't tried a whole lot of other things, but our cabbage looks beautiful right now. One said, I recently put in raised beds in the only area I had. The beds only receive about five hours of sunlight. Do you know what herbs and vegetables grow well in that amount of sun? Well, a lot of your your stuff will want six to eight hours of sunlight. I would try though, because you might be able to get some production, five hours of a good solid block of sun. You might be able to get some like peppers and tomatoes and things like that. More sun, the better for those, but uh, most of your herbs will do really well with that. Um, greens, carrots, beets. Um, I think beans would do it. I think in that sort of situation, you just need, it's like so close. <laughs> Uh, that you would just need to do some experimenting to see what happens, what you can get out of them. Debbie said, your community is lucky to have you guys. Did one chicken pass away? Wasn't there four before? No, I have a broody hen right now. 
she goes through that every once in a while. She snaps out of it pretty fast. So she was up in the nesting box. I can get her out with mealworms most of the time. Most of the time I can coax her out. Sharon said, how do you know when to add a pressure regulator and backflow preventer to the setup or is it part of the timer? I thought about that. There, we didn't add that. Yeah, so those things are like recommended. Oh, I don't use them all the time. Mm -hmm. um, when we're doing a specific video about drip, we try to include all of the proper yeah, parts. Yeah, because you don't want to get called out. I'm like, well, you didn't say to do like this. Like you, you got called out. Yeah, I saw right. that comment quite a lot. And yeah, I, actually, I mean, like, I don't know. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we add it after the fact, after we're like, oh, dang. Right. <laughs> that needs to be, that pressure needs to be regulated down a bit. Um, so it's just trial and error sometimes. It feels like uh, water stuff like that is a little bit more of like an art and less of a science. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It probably is. If you have the right tools and you know exactly what your pressure is and you know what your water source is, you know, like it's different if you're pulling from a well uh -huh. versus like city water, you know, like one is going to have more particulates in it versus the other. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, Bridget said, do you have problems with roly poly slash pill bugs eating your newly sprouted seeds? This year they've wreaked havoc on my zucchini seedlings. Um, I haven't had an issue with that. I know I've got them. I mean, every time I pull stuff out of the raised beds, I mean, that soil is teeming with bugs, all kinds of bugs. I don't know what all of them are. I did squish a few little green caterpillars when I pulled the spinach out that I had found. Uh, but everything else I just kind of leave alone because I feel like they eat a lot of the decayed matter and stuff like that. And they just really, we have really good luck with the beds up there. And I rarely treat with anything. If I notice any kind of like earwig, that's my big thing. If we've got earwigs, I'll put a bait down. Uh, but that's rare. I haven't put a bait down in a long time. Mm -hmm. I did notice, so the lamb's ear that we dug up from right in front of the kitchen and moved to another area nearby, it's getting eaten by like slugs or something. Mm. First time I've noticed, I think it's all the rain and moisture and cool temperatures we've had, but I'm noticing like big holes being eaten out and I never have that problem before. Mm. So I need to bait right there. Alice said, have we seen any of your wedding pictures? Yeah, we posted some. <laughs> I suppose we did, yeah. On Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah said, thanks for sharing your planting errands. I love seeing all the combination of, of combinations of plants and containers. Question, since you've completed a few rice bed gardens, what are your lessons learned? Things you do and definitely not do. I definitely would not miter my corners. We posted a video about uh, raised beds. Did we? Mm -hmm. Like a few years ago. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. I watched it uh, like a couple weeks ago. Oh, really? And I was like, yeah, it's a pretty good video. I have no memory of such things. Yeah. Maybe we can link that down below. Would that be yeah. helpful to answer this question? Probably. I don't think there's a lot of things we've done in raised beds that I do. Oh, I would not put junk at the bottom. Like filler yeah. material, don't do that. Just put soil in them. Um, I still think you could put large logs. We did that at the bottom of the Hartley beds because those were like four and a half feet deep. Mm -hmm. And that's ridiculous. That's a huge amount of reservoir. But we did put quite a lot of raised bed mix on top of it. And those were big, yeah, big logs. It'll take forever to 18 break down. inches. 18 inch soil reservoir. 18 inches of soil. You can put, you can put big logs. Yeah, but the blueberry containers, we put the bark nuggets at the bottom of those. And those are definitely over 18 inches. Mm -hmm. And that was horrible. Yeah. I would never do that again. Yeah, maybe not mulch. It was bark nugget. They're like big chunky bark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would never do that again. The soil lowered quite a bit. Oh, it was horrid. And the so the water just shot right through it. Like yeah. I could not saturate the, the soil. It was really weird. Um, and I wouldn't miter my corners like we did ours. I would just let the wood come together like a normal person would. It looked pretty for a long time mm -hmm. with the miter edges. It looked a little bit more elegant, less chunky, but when it starts to get wet and you know the wood splays out they're all held together with metal brackets so they're not going to fall apart but it just looks bad um i don't think i there's anything else in particular uh donut domination said why didn't you install a psi regulator and a backflow preventer at the senior home we already talked about that so moving on to the but next didn't feel like it didn't feel like <laughs> that's why <laughs> awesome erin <Yeah. laughs> um you know i saw somebody on instagram and this was kind of a freeing thing for me because a lot of what we do, it's like we do what we want to do when, uh, when we want to do it. Yeah. Except for, I feel like we're more like that now. Mm -hmm. I feel like um, when we were first doing videos, we were so careful because we didn't want to be called out. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't want to have to explain every single 
element of our decision making, you know what I mean? Right. So we just tried to do everything proper. But I saw somebody on Instagram, and I cannot remember who it was, but it was somebody who was starting their sunflowers and things from seed in trays. And it's always recommended to direct sow those. And she's like, you know what? I do it because I want to do it that way. And if you all have a problem with that, yeah. like, just leave your comments to yourself. Right. But I like to start my sunflowers, my zinnias, my cosmos. I like to start them in trays uh, for whatever reason. And I'm just going to do it that way. So I don't know why, but I'm like, yes. Right. You do what you want. You do, what you, you do it the way you want to do it. I need to, yeah. I don't know. I feel like I just went off on a tangent. That was good. Next video was planting the most beautiful blue spruce trees. And I think this was the last video from this week. So we were down at the garden center and I found a couple of Bonnie blue blue spruces and there's a couple more down there. I'm like trying to resist not going and getting them because they're so pretty, but they grow about 25 feet tall, 15 feet wide. Um, and they have very thin needles, which is atypical of a blue spruce. They have a little bit more of a soft, unique appearance, a little, little bit more elegant. Um, and they're just the most sparkly, bright, silvery blue. I just love them. So that's what we did, and that was it. It was a pretty short video, but it was one of those days where the rain kind of pushed our project way out you know, into the day, and we just really didn't have time to tackle anything else. And sometimes like planting two big sp spruce trees is a pretty good day, I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cindy said, I love blue spruce. Those are perfect. How many years do you think it will take to fill that space up? It's gonna be gorgeous. Well, they'll grow about 12 to 18 inches a year. And what do you think it is right now? Three feet tall? Yeah. So it'll take like 20 to 20 plus years to get to its full size. But and it'll be pretty along the way. It too. will be. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why typically if we can get a hold of bigger evergreens, we will because you're paying for so many years of growth. Uh, but the Bonnie Blue, I think that was the biggest size that they could get. And it was a little bit more of a specialty variety. Uh, Wendy said, would love to see a tour of your most favorite plants or places in the garden, and then an explanation as to why. That's a good idea. Because yeah. I do have pockets that are I favor over others. Mm -hmm. Snowball Jen Jen said, I noticed you plant your trees and pines so close together. When they mature, will they be too close together? Nope. Depends on what you're going for. You know, like in your parents' garden, they've got stuff that... Way uh, closer together than grows we do. Really, yeah, they planted really close together. But it, it looks nice. It does look nice. And at this point, I think everything has uh, room to be its mature size. Mm -hmm. And like either barely touch or not touch quite. Yeah. Well, so we're going to be putting more stuff in there because we want it to be more full and um, a little bit more dense. Uh, Whitney said, what kind of boots does Aaron have on? Laughing, crying emoji. <laughs> I wonder if you could see the brand on them when I was... Maybe. What They're were they? Were they... DeWalt. DeWalt boots. Yeah. Nice. Maria said, what's the name of that bush to the right of the spruce at 720? That is a black lace elderberry. One of the best shrubs in our area ever. They are amazing growers. They are not fussy. They look like like a Japanese maple replacement. If you mm -hmm. can't put Japanese maples in the sun, which we can't hear because they fry, you can put one of those in and they have kind of the same leaf structure and the kind of darker color. Although it's a little more on like the purple black side mm -hmm. as opposed to like the red Japanese maples. But they bloom like this in the spring with those gorgeous discs, discs of bloom. We've done a... Um, like a highlight, highlight video on these, one of our neighbors, the most glorious uh, like bank of these. And then those discs are followed by little berries, which I, I think they're technically edible. I mean, they're an elderberry, but the birds usually- They don't self-seed. No, yeah. they don't spread anywhere. Uh, but the instant karma elderberries, amazing. Uh, the lemony lace elderberries, also amazing. Love them all. And you guys, that is it for this week's recap video. So now we're going to go out and make another one, <laughs> another video. We're going to do some planting. I think it's a good day for it. It's a little bit breezy, but it's going to feel nice out there. So thank you guys so much for watching this one. I hope you're having a great start to your week. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.